You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for April 10th, 2020. It's not safe for work. Coming to you live from the Cornfield Resistance, where this Easter we will be celebrating Pontius Pilate as a hand-washing role model. It's the professional left with Drip Glass and Blue Gal. I'm not yeah. saying he's a good role model, but you know no, what? He's, he's not. He's in a position of leadership. And at this moment, I'm trying to figure out who I'd prefer in a leadership position. Because while he would give up Jesus, I know Trump would do the same, except Trump would gloat about it and tweet about it and mock people and, and make a big shit show of it. And then call Jesus weak, weakest ever, bad Messiah, stupid guy. No, no, Barabbas is my guy. Many people have told me great things about Barabbas. And he would never fucking shut up about it. So if you're going to have someone betray Jesus, I'd rather someone do it with a little class, you know? (laughs) Well, Pontius Pilate did pull a Trump, really, Mm -hmm. with I alone can fix it. And then it's not my responsibility. I take no responsibility. So he he really was the model for that. And you know what? I think Donald Trump's name will live in history just like Pilate's. I think Mm -hmm. it will, too. I absolutely do. Somewhere between Uh, Typhoid Mary and Jack the Ripper, you will find... (laughs) <laughs> Donald Trump from now until the end of time. Drip class. Yes. Donald Trump tweeted, happy Good Friday to all. I, I know. Charlie Pierce and I had a little exchange over that earlier today. Oh, really? Yeah. I said something like from the anti-Christian idiot division of Hallmark. And uh, <laughs> he said "I can something like, I can hear cocks crowing already. Yeah. <laughs> and I replied, woman, I do not know him. <laughs> now I like the tax cuts, but I never like the tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> they will deny and deny, deny and deny and deny. Yeah. Yep. But right now he's the so-called president of the United States, and we have to cope with that. All of us <sighs> have to cope with that in our own way. Big hugs, virtual social distancing, hugs to all of our listeners. We love you so much. Mm-hmm. We're thinking about you. We've heard from you. Uh, good news and bad, and we're just grateful to hear from you. I want to do a shout out to my dad in Pittsburgh, who yeah. was without power because they had a bad storm. They did, and uh, much of the East has had a bad storm, and uh, he was without power Tuesday night until just after midnight Friday morning. So, long time to go without power. He's eighty four. He found a way to do. The New York Times crossword puzzle in ink, as he always does every morning. Yes. He got out a flashlight and did it Mm -hmm. and charged his phone by driving around the block in his car. Yeah. uh, Plugged his phone into his car and got it charged that way so that he could reach all of us. And uh, I'm real proud of him. So, um, but health, health and good, good safety to all of our listeners and whatever kind of holy celebration or lack thereof you are commemorating this week uh we wish you well yeah as as i i wrote a post last week about this is the year when we're all celebrating passover yes right yeah we all want some of us some of us are not uh so fortunate as to have this disease miss our house and uh we feel for you that it is not a punishment from god i refuse to believe that no 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 Uh, i mean in the sense that we're all at home praying for deliverance from a plague and from a tyrant. Mm-hmm. So Right. Oh, both. Right. Right. Uh, a tyrant who is at war now with the Wall Street Journal, Drift Glass. Really? That l- noted liberal bastion, the Wall liberal Street Journal? Bastion, fake news, fake news. Uh, I, I am absolutely convinced that uh, we're going to get to the point where uh, the only trusted sources in the Trump White House are OAN and the Trump at Mar-a-Lago newsletter, mm-hmm. and that'll be it. Oh, don't and forget no, the Federalist and Storm Stormfront, honey. They're both Stormfront yeah. Federalists. There you, you know. go. All four of which we have no idea how they're funded. And there's a new press secretary, quote unquote, at the White House who yeah. will not hold press briefings. Kaylee McEnany replaces uh, Stephanie Grisham. We didn't think we could do any worse than Stephanie Grisham, but Donald Trump is always eager to 
surprise us by going lower and choosing a birther as right. his press secretary. Right. And you might remember Kaylee McEnany. She's a tiny uh, wisp of an attack gerbil who, yeah. who never actually listens to anything anyone ever asked her. She just blinks very fast. And you can just hear her sort of shaking her rear like a cat would just before pouncing in the middle of a conversation to deliver the bullshit lying talking point that she has been charged with delivering. And, and she's, she's very well disciplined in that. Yes, she I is. mean, if you watch her, she knows how to do mm -hmm. this thing. And it, 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 uh, she's better at it actually than, uh, Kellyanne Conway. And you know that the, they're cut from the same cloth on that. Just oh, yeah. here's, here's what I can tell you. Uh -huh. Oh, you mean, and then you spout bullshit. Yeah. The dear leader has loves us all in his heart. Like Jesus did. And he hates Democrats who are trying to destroy America. Yeah, and the reason it. she exists at all is because CNN pulled out the chair for her. Yeah. That there was nobody else who was going to be a spokesperson for the Trump campaign who wasn't a bottom-feeding scumbag. And so— And she's a good-looking blonde, so we're going to put her on TV, yeah. and we're going to make her the spokesperson for the other side because we have to have both sides. So her profile is 50% Jeff Zucker. So if you want to write Jeff Zucker yeah. a nice note thanking him so much for basically filling in half of the Trump cabinet— uh, yeah. You should really do so and let him really know what you think, because Jeff's a, well, Jeff's a and listener. I think, I think there's a whole, uh, and I, I don't call it a conspiracy because I think it's really out in the open, mm -hmm. a whole desire to make sure that there are federal government benefits for every possible professional in the Trump campaign that can get it. Yes. And it's a blatant violation of the Hatch Act to have mm -hmm. all of these people, including the so-called president. Yeah. campaigning from the White House over and over and over again. Uh, it's it's a violation of law, and they don't care. Well, and like, as with the inspector generals, which uh, yeah. Trump is in the middle of firing, mm -hmm. you know, firing the people who were supposed to look out for our money as the Trump administration and his cronies loot the place, he's firing the cops. And just yeah. as happened with impeachment, if the, the court that sits on the case is corrupt as the Republican... Senate was utterly corrupt. And if the cops who are charged with enforcing it are corrupt, as all of Trump appointees are corrupt, and if the attorney general is corrupt, all in the same direction, Donald Trump doesn't need to worry about shit. Nobody's going to call him on it because he has completely gutted the rule of law in this country and replaced it with fellow traveling criminals and apologists mm -hmm. and, and, and demagogues and lunatics. And so we can sort of forget about it. There's a, um, thing that jay rosen says we don't have a white house anymore yeah we have a building but there are just a bunch of bumble fucks and criminals running away with the place and a, a surrounded by a press corps that is desperately wishing into existence every day an imaginary white house that's doing stuff because the pillars are all the same and the driveway looks the same and you know that that podium looks the same and but it's not there is no more federal government in this country outside of the Democrats in Congress and the governors out there. The federal government's busy ripping the place off, killing its citizens, and laughing about it. And 60 million Americans are cool with that. And that that's a problem. That's a really big problem. One thing, however, that the coronavirus has done is if there was any facade left, any mask left for on the right, it's gone now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Republican Party and the conservative movement are now truly exposed. And I often say exposed to whom? Because we all knew this. But they stand naked before the world as who they truly are. And there's lots of reasons why this particular pandemic has shown that the conservative movement and the Republican Party are utterly unfit to occupy any position of trust or authority ever again in this country. And we made a little list. Would you like to go through them with me? Sure, I would. Uh, and I added a couple things to them, so don't be surprised. I'm always surprised by you, baby. So, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Donald Trump at last count was up to 46 rage tweets this yeah. morning, including something about if Elizabeth Warren dropped out of the race. <laughs> yeah. And everybody's yeah. going, what? Yeah, that Adderall is finally, that, that blood I, brain. Yeah, I, it's yeah. three hours ago he tweeted, if Elizabeth Warren got out of the race before Super Tuesday. Yeah. Well, he was and talking it, about he no, he was he was talking about how Bernie was betrayed by Elizabeth Sanders. By, by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren. 
Oh, yeah, so he's she, just you, trying to sow discontent. Oh, yeah. That's all he does. He's a chaos agent. And yeah, the only yeah. people he's sowing, you know, anything among are the same paint drinking sister fucking hillbillies who who still believe in it. Because who, who's going to listen to him with about advice about the Democratic primary race? Well, Chuck Todd, probably. But Chuck Todd. That, I can't, <laughs> I can't think of a soul out there who would do that. Chuck Todd exists. You, know, God. No, you underestimate his political instincts. Brief, Gal, you really for do. a brief moment, I forgot about Chuck Todd, and you just reminded me. I'm Shame sorry. Me. <laughs> let's, get on, let's get on to our happy Easter list of how the right. Republican Party is wrecking America. Right. Well, that's not, just, that's not just like you said, it's ripped the mask, and we mean that in a punny yeah. way. But literally, the mask has been ripped off of the conservative policy proposals. Mm -hmm. that they're bs all right go ahead drift glass well the the number one thing uh this this completely repudiates everything to do with the reagan revolution which Mm -hmm. we're living in the 40th year of government actually isn't the problem unless you go out of your way to make it the problem we actually need a government to actually work Mm -hmm. and that is something that Deep down in their DNA, Republicans just won't agree with. They would they would rather, really, truly rather see the country burned to the ground than admit that you actually need a functioning federal government to do big shit that the, we, the citizens, need done, and not just cut taxes. There's a yeah. lot of stuff. And so really the whole Grover do. Norquist thing is over. I mean. Yeah. You just don't get to drown government in a bathtub during a pandemic. You need government to work, work together, coordinate efforts, Mm -hmm. and be as efficient as possible. Yeah. And for that, you need a staff. (laughs) And this is what Donald Trump really doesn't understand. The only staff he's going to have left in November are his idiot son-in-law and daughter. That's And and a bunch of Fox News wannabes. That's it. Yeah, this is Uh, a... This is parallel to a conversation I had on uh, social media with someone who's talking about why the press is always going to fail because you can replace all the bad actors, but the institution it, institutionally is incapable of changing. Mm-hmm. And my argument is always the institution is people. Yeah. That's who creates and, and transmits institutional culture. So if you, if you want the government to work, you need to actually have people in the government who believe in government and who are competent public servants who you actually pay a living wage to, to serve the public Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because government needs to be like a fire extinguisher. It needs to be kept in good condition and it needs to be in place at all times. It can't just be, well, you know, we haven't used it in months. Let's just throw it away. Mm -hmm. Um, Globalism works to create supplies and cooperation. And then you build walls and tear down stockpiles and it all goes to shit. Yep. Yep. And that's the problem with, not having a stockpile of maintained ventilators, maintained masks, maintained supplies and equipment. And then for, again, the idiot son-in-law to say, well, this is our stockpile. Right. The states need to have their own stockpiles and this is our stockpile and we'll keep our stockpile. The stockpile, the federal stockpile is to distribute to the states. That's the purpose of it. In a pandemic. And he didn't maintain it. And that's why the equipment's breaking down. And yeah, they canceled the contract. Right. Back in 2018, the Trump administration canceled the maintenance contract on a a ventilator supplies, uh, which is why a lot of them rotted or fell apart. You actually have to keep things in good and working order. Donald Trump does not understand this. He's used to going in, trashing something, taking every dime of value out of it and leaving the husk of it behind and cheating people along the way. He does not understand the need to actually maintain a well-run organization that that serves the public, that isn't there for, to make profit, that isn't there to, to, to sell to people. It's there to serve the public and requires constant, ongoing maintenance by competent staff who you should never see. I should never have to worry about the, what the CDC is up to. That's why right. my federal government hires experts. I should never have to worry personally about whether or not the head of my government is stuffing my tax dollars into his pockets because he went and got rid of all the cops. Right. That should never happen. And the reason it's happening is because Republicans are in charge, not Donald Trump, because Republicans are in charge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a big one. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, em- uh, you're, you're on a roll. <laughs> well, employer-based health care is a failure. Yeah. It's a complete failure. 
I appreciate the fact that it started that way in 19 rum, 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 in back in the previous century and that unions fight like hell to get benefits to their members. And I, I get all that. I had employer-based health care when I had it. Then when I was laid off, suddenly I had COBRA, which was an insane amount of money per month just to maintain the coverage I had. Bled right through at the exact time when you're already losing, you know, bleeding money th- for mortgage and covering all your other bills because you're unemployed. Uh they're taking massive chunks out of your savings just to make, and it only lasted for what, six months or 12 months or something like that. But it, it most people, when they lose their jobs, can't afford it. Yeah. Really no, it, cannot it, afford Cobra. Yeah. No. So the idea that this public health thing, this public health right should be administered through private employers is insane. Now, yeah. there is a solution to it. And the solution uh, before a pandemic was incremental change. And I, I believe in incremental change, not because I don't want the end product, but because I, I've never seen anything move forward with lightning speed in this country other than going to war. Right. Um, right. There are simply too many choke points along the way that Republicans can stand athwart and say no and stop anything from happening. I should include Joe Lieberman in that, in that bunch. Yeah, too. right, right. Um, and it just didn't seem feasible to me, given our government and the way our government is dysfunctional and how it has worked my entire life, that anything massive like Medicare for all could ever pass um, other than step by step by step as we approach full coverage for everyone. Now, if that has all changed, great. That's a wonderful thing. But it doesn't mean that human nature has changed, and it doesn't mean the Republican Party has changed. And the Republican Party will lay down on the tracks and stop. These are people who are trying to get rid of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) They're not going to be your friends. No one on the Republican Party is going to work to help anyone in in the Democratic Party to pass anything that gives any more health care to anybody. Mm -hmm. So we need a massive supermajority in both houses of Congress, and we need to get the Republican Party gone. They need to disappear like the fucking Whigs. But the idea that we should deliver vital public services based on an employer-based distribution system is clearly insane and long overdue for massive reform. I'm reading a book. I was just going to go look up the name of it. I'm sorry. I don't have it here. Is it called Marching Towards Coverage? Yes. How Women Can Lead the Fight for Universal Health Care? Yes, I'm reading that. By it's Rosemary by Rosemary Day. Day. Right. I'm reading that book. Mm-hmm. It's in. It's on. The reason Drift Glass has it is it's on the bed back in the bedroom. Yeah. Uh, and I ha- I don't want to report on it because I haven't read all of it, but I do know that one of the points she makes and the re- one of the reasons that you do things incrementally, um, if you just if you were to just tomorrow go to Medicare for all and say everybody has Medicare and you're done. That sounds great. That does nothing to curb costs from hospitals and pharma like Eli Lilly. Mm-hmm. Um, this is this is the po- the other point about healthcare that I wanted to make. Eli Lilly this week announced that all patients, uh, insured or not, and this doesn't account doesn't include Medicare and Medicaid, which already have their own coverage for insulin, but mm-hmm. uninsured insured, et cetera, will pay no more than a $35 copay per month for insulin. Right. For Eli Lilly insulin. And they could have done this years ago. This has been profiteering for years, for four or five years. They've just, Mm -hmm. the cost of insulin has exploded. And uh, this is another thing that the coronavirus pandemic has proved. There are things you can do in -hmm. an emergency that should Mm -hmm. have been done years ago. And all of a sudden, because there's, you know, everyone's out of work and you're losing market share, you're going to lower the cost. You're you're actually able to lower the cost by yourself with no government intervention. You just decided to do this. Right. And uh, you don't get a PR boost from that. You are not a good corporate citizen for doing that, Eli Lilly. Uh, this should this product is necessary for people to live. Mm-hmm. And so this. The Rosemary Day. Again, I don't want to quote her because I don't have the book in front of me. You do. <laughs> and I do. also, uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to misrepresent what she's saying in her book, but she does talk a lot about lowering costs as part of a package. And you want to make sure that you don't just put everyone on government insurance and not have any kind of cost controls in 
as part of that package because all you're doing is shifting the burden of payment. You're not shifting it from an individual to the government. The individual is still going to pay for it. It's mm-hmm. just going to be an outrageous price no matter what it is because it's life. Right. And if you try to put cost controls in after you've given everybody insurance, then it's, oh, my God, you're cutting Medicare. Right. You're, you're leaving my mother to die. And so it's politically impossible to put in cost controls after you've given everyone insurance. So you've got to do them in tandem. You've got to make sure that you've limited the amount of profit that people can make off of people dying uh, or living. And that's that's what we're dealing with in our healthcare system today is people have the ability to blackmail patients Mm -hmm. into paying whatever it takes to stay alive. And the pandemic is erasing that argument because no one should have to pay anything for a vaccine or a cure for a pandemic. No. No. Governments of this world have to pay for that. We have to pay for that as a world, as a planet. Yeah. And if necessary, the government should start manufacturing those drugs. Right. Oh, I mean, absolutely. You know, the, the, yeah. It, I, I'm a great believer. The military in, should have to manufacture those yeah. drugs. Right. I right. don't want to socialize the private market for uh, research, but I understand that the private market for research is heavily supported by the government anyway. Government right. An and and now they're allowed, research. universities are allowed to patent their drugs. That has just had a chilling effect on research no. because you're you're more willing to keep your research close to your chest because you'll make a profit off of it. Uh, and if you're taking federal dollars for your research, it's got to be like the polio vaccine. No, you don't get to put a patent on it. it. It's like patenting the sun, as Jonas Salk said. The other thing, this is kind of goes along with things that we didn't think you could do, but you, oh my God, look, what we can do it. We are canceling loans with China right now because obviously they're being hit very hard by the pandemic and we need a relationship with them. Yeah. Well, if we, and and we're also giving loans quite rightly and through small business administration is a clusterfuck, but we're trying to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Small businesses uh, to have payroll help. And those two choices, they they have a a couple of choices they can make and they have to decide which they want to do. And one is a forgivable loan and one is not. Right. And the forgivable loan is for primarily for payroll. Well, if we can, if we can find ways to do all of that, then we can cancel loans with college students and we can cancel loans with Latin America and we can cancel loans with Puerto Rico. We can restructure Puerto Rico's debt so that it's not crippling that, that island. The pandemic is really changing the way, the lens through which we, we as a society look through things. And it's good for progressivism that we're doing this. We don't brag about being right all the time. <laughs> we just are right, right. all the time. Right. And, and that's the problem because we really yeah. should be bragging that we're right all the time. All the time. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I, I believe in people making a profit off of their labor. I believe mm-hmm. in rewarding excellence. I believe that someone who does an amazing job, remarkable job, stupendous job should reap rewards like that. Uh, that's fine. That That is not the opposite of making sure that everyone else is taken care of. Yeah, Those are right. not ex- mutually exclusive things. You can balance those things. I do not want the government in the business of making cars. I want the government in the business of setting standards rigorous standards by which cars are made. And then mm-hmm. I'll let the private sector figure out which one's the best and, and which one has value. But here are the emission standards and here are the safety standards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what government can do to industry to make it behave correctly. Government can also tax the shit out of people. The, the, this is a grossly undertaxed country. Under Eisenhower, the top marginal tax rate was in the 90s. Under Kennedy, uh, the revolution of Kennedy was to cut it from 90 to 74, I think, or 73 or 72. But the reason those tax rates were so high was not, you know, there were millionaires. There were people living in really big houses. There were people having luxurious lives. But there was a premium put on plowing that money back into the country where you raised your capital. There was a premium on buying new equipment and setting up new factories and building houses for people and setting up schools. There was a a common sense of we are all in this together. We just came through a giant depression and a great war, and we are all in this together. And it's great that you can get rich, but we have to take care of the entire community, except, of course, for women and minorities. Those right. were those were just getting screwed right and left. But the the idea of making America live up to its promise seems to me 
like a very new and radical concept and as old as the Constitution and Lincoln and Martin Luther King. Another thing we've learned from this coronavirus pandemic is that the country actually needs frontline workers. Yeah. Nurses, cooks, farmers, grocery store clerks, far more than it needs CEOs. And $15 an hour is underpaid. Yeah, grossly underpaid. And we've also learned the government can and should intervene in the economy to whatever extent is necessary when the economy is not serving the good of the people. That seems very crazy to me, but that the government does that every day. Like I said, the government sets standards for auto emissions and pollution and quality of water and worker safety, all of which, by the way, Republicans have been rolling back now that Donald Trump is president. He wants to get rid of all those things. He wants the country to be dirty, unsafe, racist and terrified at all times i don't i think he'd be perfectly happy regard i don't think he even cares how the country is i don't no. think he even thinks of it that way he thinks of it in terms of quid pro quo in his pockets and if clean air if he could bottle that and put the trump name on it and sell it he would do that uh well, it's think- more profitable to put a co-lobbyist in charge of the epa And I want you to think about that while you're thinking about who you're going to support in the general election. I don't think it's a big problem with our listeners, but I understand, excuse me, I understand that there is a certain amount of mourning going on this week. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play in just a minute a uh, interview with my son. Oh, you got him? I've got him. We're going to, yeah, that's a good get. (laughs) he's, He's hard to get. He's booked in a lot of places, but you got him. In fact, let's play that right now. So everybody, I want to introduce you to uh, my oldest son. We call him Junior Dude. Hi, hi, Junior. Hi, hi. mom. Good to talk to you. It's uh, great to talk to you too, Junior Dude. And I wanted to have him on the show uh, in part because uh, he's a younger voter, twenty-one, and also because of his political action that he has done in the twenty twenty race so far. Uh, David was a volunteer in Iowa for Elizabeth Warren. And uh, do you want to share how you voted in the Illinois primary? Sure. Because Elizabeth Warren dropped out, I ultimately ended up voting for Bernie Sanders. Okay. And that's the reason I wanted to have you on the show is because as a younger voter and as a Bernie Sanders voter, Bernie Sanders dropped out this week and you and I watched his speech together and I wanted to get your reaction to it. Yep. Well, it was it was a really good speech that he gave. I, I thought it was a really good speech. Um, of course, I am extremely disappointed that he dropped out, and that yeah, I'm, I'm very disappointed that he dropped out, mm-hmm. and because I think he would have, I personally think he would have been the best candidate to take on Donald Trump. Uh-huh. But, and I told you at the time that. You know, my first choice for president has never actually in my adult lifetime been the Democratic nominee. So uh, mm-hmm. I can't, I don't have a good record <laughs> of of choosing the winner. You know, I go with my All heart right. in the primaries. Yeah, you know? well, same here, same here. I have voted uh, for Bernie Sanders this year, and I also voted for him in 2016 as well. So That's right, that's right. Yeah. You did, you were old enough to vote in 2016, just barely, right? Yes, just, but I, I, I liked Bernie Sanders then. I like him now, and mm-hmm. yeah, it, so it it was really heartbreaking to to see him drop out uh-huh. again. And so, um, you know that uh, Bernie has said that he talked to Obama and to Biden this week before he dropped out, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. um it looks like he's going to stay uh, on the ballot in uh, many states so that he can influence the Democratic platform. Uh, yep. Uh, you know, Joe Biden announced this week that he's interested in lowering the Medicare age to 60. And mm-hmm. a lot of people are saying, well, why did you put the six on there? Why not lower it to zero? <laughs> um, what <laughs> Uh, how do you feel about Bernie Sanders working with Joe Biden and talking to Barack Obama? How do you feel about him sort of? I I think it's good. Mm -hmm. I think uh, both in the interest of party unity, also making sure that some, at least some of his policies are included and that, and that the progressive, the progressive voters like myself can feel at home while supporting Joe Biden. Uh Uh-huh. 
And so you are you are going to support Joe Biden in the general election? Yes, yes. I, I, I even even Joe Biden is better than Donald Trump. And yeah. I don't like I don't really like Joe Biden that much. So uh-huh. that's saying something. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, I appreciate that perspective. I want you to know that I'm very proud of you. I'm proud of your liberal credentials. Uh, you went to Washington for the march on for our lives, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, so that you've done you've done some uh, quite a bit of political activism uh, mm-hmm. just just in a and you're only 21, so you've got a long way to go. Thank you. So, what issues are most important to you in the 2020 uh, Democratic platform? What would you like to see in that platform? Uh, an end to the drug war. Oh yeah, and, and and that's my number one issue because it just seems so obvious that what we've been doing over the past half century has not worked and it's costing billions and billions of dollars a year. And I just always, it's a waste of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that money really could be better spent elsewhere. Good. Well, thank you. That's my number one uh, priority. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that with us. I really appreciate it. And I promise this won't be the last time you're on the podcast. (laughs) All right. Awesome. All right. Talk, thank talk you. See you later. Love ya. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Love you. And, and so I'm so glad that he was able to be on uh, mm-hmm. and he's home and was able to do that. And and his, his point is good, which is he said, and he's 21. He said, look, I don't like Joe Biden that much, but Donald Trump is just that bad. <laughs> I'm going to vote for Biden, yeah. even though I'm heartbroken. Yeah. And I just want you to figure out in your mind how much health care you're going to get from Donald Trump in the next four years and how much education you're going to get from Betsy DeVos in the next four years. Mm-hmm. And the EPA director being a coal lobbyist, can the planet survive that? Mm-hmm. That's what we're up against. And and Ruth Bader Ginsburg really needs you to vote for Joe Biden. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just yeah. that this is going to go on and on for decades if we don't rein it in now and rein it in hard. And I am in all in favor of the idea of putting two more on the court and the first one being Merrick Garland yeah. to right the wrong and unstack the courts. And that's how you need to market it. We need to unstack the courts and right the wrong of the stealing of a seat and say the compromise is Gorsuch gets to stay on the court. That's the compromise. We've already compromised. Hmm. Um, and we're going to add two seats. So one one of the things that we have to that that we have known for a long time mm-hmm. is that Republicans, and I mean Republican voters, base voters, local Republican elected officials, Republican bundlers, Republican frontmen, Republican ad people, people who are just have an R after their name as a matter of course and as a matter of, of family lineage, really are dangerously unhinged government hating zombies who cannot be trusted to run anything at all. And a corollary to that is their their media. Yeah. Because Fox News and other conservative media is a threat to public health and national security. Yeah. And I and and should, should no more be allowed. This is your writing. I should oh, yeah. let you read it. <laughs> well I just it's there there are parallels and they should no more be allowed to broadcast in the United States than Tokyo Rose or Lord Haw Haw. And Lord Haw Haw was the American born Britain named Brit uh, American born Britain named William Joyce, who broadcast Nazi propaganda to the UK from Germany during the Second World War. And if you listen if you if you pay attention to Laura Ingram or Sean Hannity mm-hmm. or any of the rest of those those lunatics and liars and demagogues on the right, they are as big a threat to this country propaganda wise as was uh, Tokyo Rose and Lord Haw Haw in World War mm-hmm. II. They, are, they mm-hmm. are a threat to the national health of this country. And I mean direct. They're telling people to do things that endanger their lives. They're lying to them about public health issues. And they're lying to them about what's being done in their name by the government. And they're lying to them about who's at fault for everything. And the people who watch this are equally to blame. They could change the fucking channel. But there's no doubt that you can trace a whole bunch of what went wrong with this country back to Rupert fucking Murdoch. Yep. And and his holdings in this country need to be stripped from him and either shut down completely or turned over to an actual public broadcasting organization that will broadcast in the public interest. I don't care how loud they bitch about First Amendment. You do not have the right to 
to shout fire in a, in a crowded movie house. You do not have to, the right to shout hoax during the middle of a pandemic. And that's what they did, and they should pay for it with their jobs. There should be no more jobs for Sean Hannity ever again. There should be no more jobs for Tucker Carlson. I want to drive up to McDonald's and see Tucker fucking Carlson asking me if I want a hot apple pie with that. That's it. They are the enemy of this country, and they need to be treated like an enemy during wartime. They need to be stripped of their powers and put aside for the rest of us until we survive this thing. Then we'll get on to the, the, the trials. Then we'll get on to truth and reconciliation. Then we'll get on to Nuremberg shit. But these people have been let off the hook far too long. And it is time for them to pay a very heavy price for the damage they've inflicted on the rest of us. And that is all I have to say about... Well, I want you to switch gears and talk about Caddyshack. Oh, yeah. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> See, he just went off He just went off in that real angry... Uh, that was angry drift glass. Now we're going to talk about Caddyshack drift glass. <laughs> nah, I'm still, I'm still angry. Um, <laughs> okay, this is going to ramble just a little bit. So you'll, you'll bear with me, won't you? Sure. As you know, for my health to keep my cardiac level up, I listen to conservative podcasts. So I'd like to know what they're doing. I specifically listen to The Bulwark, which is a podcast uh, that is essentially a human personnel transfer from the Weekly Standard, which got gutted during the, the rise of Trump and became The Bulwark. Oh, same people, same writing, same political stance, same everything, except now they're, they're all very anti-Trump. They're very, very, very much against Donald Trump. And I pay attention to them because I'm, I'm watching how they are setting themselves up to be let off the hook when Donald Trump is out of office. They're lifeboat builders they are for themselves, right? And, and they are absolutely positively lining themselves up to be the left once Trump is gone. They're, they're the reasonable center left people who told you, we warned you Donald Trump would be bad. We even left the party. Well, A, you were thrown out, you know, collar and belt tossed to the curb by these people. And B, you built this fucking thing. So while all the other tumult is going on in the world, Think of me like Brian Doyle Murray at the end of Caddyshack. There's shit blowing up. There's people screaming. There's, there's golf clubs flying in the air. My job is to keep my eye on the ball and the hole. Mm -hmm. I, I, and no one gave me this job, but I think it's very important that we keep our eye on what these people who created this Republican Party are up to while the rest of us are worried about our lives and our health. And... For example, I did earlier today listen to the latest episode of The Bulwark, which featured Charlie Sykes talking to Tim Miller. Now, Tim Miller might ring a bell with some of you. Tim Miller was a, a longtime GOP comms guy, worked for the GOP messaging and shit like that. And then he became a never Trumper. Then he was hired by the Pod Save America kids as their in-house Republican whisperer. Then he did some work for the, an organization that he's an officer in that ginned up some really sleazy kind of anti-Semitic slander about George Soros. And that got him kicked off of Facebook. And then the Pod Save America kids said, we'll have to look at what's going on here. And suddenly Tim Miller didn't have a job with the Pod Save boys anymore. Could have told them it would end this way, but, you know, they don't come to me for advice. So Tim Miller has lost his job with the GOP, uh, has shit himself out of a job on Pod Save America. And so he's wandering the wilderness looking for something to do. And where does he land but the bulwark, where everyone is much too polite to mention his past? So today... Well, he, let's face it. It's bloody Bill Crystal. Nobody's going right, to tell bloody right. Bill Crystal oh, to open a history well, book, right? That's, that's <laughs> the thing. If, if you're familiar with John Wick, um, being a member of the club is like having a marker. <laughs> You know, yeah. you get you get privileges. You're in, and you get to claim certain things. So he gets to go, uh, become a bulwark employee, and then he gets to have his work promoted by David Frum in the Atlantic. Well, is he a guest on the show, or is he now a regular? He's a, he's a contributor. He's a oh, he's wow. a he's a bulwark contributor who shows up on their podcast, and because he's a contributor, he also shows up on Real Time with Bill Maher. So I forget also, that the bulwark is also a blog, right? Yes, it's it also is. a website. Okay. Yes, yes, it is. And that's where they make their bread and butter. Yeah. So and so he gets his articles promoted in the Atlantic by David Frum, who's a fellow traveler. And he gets his he gets to go on Bill Maher's show because Bill Maher loves taking these assholes and giving them a huge platform. So 
there is it's a closed system. You go from the Pod Save America closed system to the Bulwark closed system, but that's not the story. The story is him and Charlie Sykes talking back and forth about whatever happened to that Republican Party we used to know and love. And they sort of kicked. And, and by the way, this podcast was literally recorded as the news about Bernie Sanders was breaking. So they were mm -hmm. kind of all over the place. It was like, mm -hmm. Charlie, hold on a second. I, there's a reporting coming in about Bernie Sanders. Okay. But they were sitting there talking about the good old days in Wisconsin. And they both kind of admitted out loud because they don't think anybody but conservatives listens to them that, yeah, we kind of knew that the base of the party was full of crazies and racists and assholes. But we figured you throw them some chum, you give them shit to do, and you keep them busy and they're not going to be a problem. We'll keep a leash on them. Don't worry. Well, and and Charlie Sykes' leash was his phone hangups because yeah. he did hang up on sure. racists. But they still call into his show, yeah. and they well, were still going to vote like him in Wisconsin. They well, were still a reliable part of his political base. He just didn't want them to air their laundry on his show. Right. He wanted yeah. – th that's the thing. He wanted the product that they had to offer. That he wanted their votes, and he wanted their listenership. He didn't want them yep. talking out loud right. about the crazy shit that he and Tim Miller both admit pretty clearly – we knew what was going on. We knew who these mm -hmm. people were. For sure. He talks. He talks about this lunch he had with Reince Priebus at the Cheesecake Factory in Wisconsin, uh -huh. and how Reince. This was when Reince was. He said, as he puts it, shiving Michael Steele. Yeah, you know, getting yeah. Michael Steele out of the way to take over the Republican Party, and he said, Priebus leaned over and said, the 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 Republican National Committee, half these people are out of their fucking minds. So it. This is not news. This this didn't come as a surprise to anyone. Everyone who worked in the Republican Party, Charlie Sykes, Tim Miller, Reince Priebus, uh, David Brooks, uh, David Frum, uh, Rick Wilson, go down the list. They all fucking knew that their base was a toxic shithole, that, was, that it was a sewer of racism and paranoia and ignorance, and, that, that, and they loved it. Because and, they, and they actually thought... And this was their huge mistake that they never talk about. Right. They actually thought that like electing Bush and nominating Romney and all that, that they were in charge of the Republican political process. Right. It turns and out it was going to be Jeb or it was going to be Rubio. Uh huh. And remember who the vice president was going to be? It was going to be Scott Walker. Scott right. Walker was going to be the running mate because Reince knew Scott real well. Sure. Reince was chairman of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's going to be Jeb and Scott Walker or Rubio and Scott Walker. We're going to have Florida and Wisconsin. And don't forget uh, Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan was going to run the house. So, right. you know. And we'll so be all we can cut taxes for billionaires again. Right. right? And, and that was the plan. yeah. And so uh, the fact that Donald Trump came in and told everyone in a debate that Jeb's brother didn't keep us safe. Right. And that. It was outrageous for the Republican Party to expect after we had reinvented the Republican Party as a Tea Party right. to forget Jeb's brother that we're going to come right around and vote for Jeb. Mm -hmm. Jeb well, Bush and, was was such a, a smack in the face to the Republican base that had worked so hard to forget George W. Bush. Well, and, and the part of leadership, and this is Charlie Sykes and Tim Miller mm -hmm. and, and all mm -hmm. the rest of them, asked Republican base voters to do something that was essentially impossible. Right. They asked them to be, they said, it's cool that you're a bigot. It's cool that you're a moron. It's cool that you're a birther. It's cool that you're an asshole. It's cool that you own the libs. All that is okay. Just don't talk about it in public. Yeah. Just, you know, when, when companies around, put your shoes on, pull your pants up and don't walk around with a Confederate flag in one hand wearing a fucking swastika. Mm -hmm. And if you if you promise not to do that, we're all cool because we're all brothers here. Wink, wink. We're all Rush Limbaugh's boys and girls. Right. We're all Gingrich boys and girls. And they told them over and over again that their bigotry was OK, that their paranoia was patriotism. Just don't fucking talk about it. And along comes Donald Trump. The only thing Donald Trump was said was it's OK to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, your party leaders have told you for decades that it's fine to be this way. They didn't kick you out. They love you. They keep giving you judges. They keep putting your psycho pastors on panels. They keep enacting insane anti-abortion laws. They keep telling you to get more fucking guns because the Kenyan usurper is coming for you. They're with you, man. They're, I'm just the one who's honest enough to tell you, let your freak flag fly. This is who we are. This is what a Republican is. And once he did that, 
the party was his. Yep. And and because every- he repeated the right wing crackpot conspiracy theories out loud out loud out yep. loud on the stage and it mortified and all of a sudden he had an entire base of voters more republican primary voters than ever before in history right. and it didn't mortify Said, charlie he's sykes saying what i'm thinking he didn't yeah. it didn't mortify charlie sykes or rick wilson or any of these assholes because it was untrue mm-hmm. he mortified them because you're not supposed to say the shit out loud that's right. the rule and so they all they all knew the party was this rotten. They all because they've all been working to make sure the party was this rotten. This party has been the Limbaugh Gingrich party for a quarter of a century. Right. They all knew. And so now they're all just running around going, Well, isn't it weird? What happened to my Republican Party? They were doing just fine. So my job, at, and which is a lonely and weird job, but I kind of enjoy it, is keeping an eye on that really specific aspect of politics. Because those people are are playing a long game. Yep. They're here. And the reason that you see almost nothing but never Trumpers all over network television where there should be fucking liberals who weren't wrong about the party all along is because networks don't want to put on liberals who will come into their circle and say, fucking Charlie Sykes knew, Rick Wilson knew, Rick Wilson created this monster. And more importantly, Drift Glass, Mm -hmm. whoever you're talking to as far as the host of whatever show you're on, your Mm -hmm. boss knew. The suits upstairs knew. The suits upstairs put on empty Trump podia for hours the summer of 2015 and the summer Mm -hmm. of 2016 and pretended that it wasn't about policy, that policy didn't matter, that making sure our eyes were on Trump and his entertainment value and his ratings value was way more important than the future of the country. Yeah, because nothing of this was going to touch them. Right. And still hasn't. Right. Their ratings are great. Donald Trump keeps reminding everybody his ratings are great. And, and here's my bottom line for all uh-huh. of you out there looking for a bumper sticker. <laughs> the Republican leadership, by their own confession, never had the slightest fucking idea what the Republican Party was all about. You know who knew about Republicans all this time? We did. And we told you about it. And we told you about it over and over again. And we were called crackpots and alarmists and go, told to go sit in the fucking corner. End of story. Uh, let's now, talk about the vote in Wisconsin and yeah. uh, switch from Caddyshack to Monty Python. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I, I made the analogy this week. You know, Monty Python's Life of Brian was just going to be a little movie. It was only yeah. going to be released on 200 screens in the United States. It was a uh, little art film, you know, a yeah. little edgy, little blasphemous. And, and then all of a sudden it was, as it was, huh? It, and it only existed because George Harrison wanted to see it. George Harrison wanted to see it, so he funded it, and that's mm-hmm. it. So, uh, but then all of a sudden, it was banned by certain Catholic and other religious groups as being blasphemous. Right, right. And uh, it made John Cleese and the rest of them rich. <laughs> so, <laughs> because we're so happy. We're everybody so happy. wants to go see it because yeah. the Catholic the Catholic League says it's blasphemous, and you mm-hmm. can't go see it. Well, uh, the Republican Party and the Supreme Court decided to tell Wisconsinites that they couldn't vote or that they would have to risk their lives to uh, exercise their vote. Uh-huh. And uh, turnout was around the block uh, and around the block and around the block. And it's mm-hmm. absurd and it should not have happened. Oh, it's obscene. Yeah. And uh, it the, the white neighborhoods had shorter lines than the black neighborhoods by a lot. Uh, we should say. And uh, yeah, that's because of Milwaukee's 180 polling places, only five were open. And I understand that. I understand there aren't enough poll workers and that some poll workers won't expose themselves to yeah. a virus, you know, that this is what happened. Uh, but this is the Guardian said Wisconsin is the state where American di- democracy went to die. It didn't die. No, democracy no. didn't die. And, and people are hard. mad as hell. Yeah. Um, so. The legislature, the state legislature convened 72 hours before polls opened in Wisconsin and convened to weigh an emergency request from the governor, Tony Evers, who's a Democrat. With COVID-19 cases in the thousands, Evers implored the lawmakers to delay in-person voting for the state's presidential primary and mail a ballot to every voter in the state for safety. Right. All, for don't safety. forget that in addition to the primary, there was a Supreme Court uh, race yeah. in on that ballot. Yep. Uh, which would have made the uh, if the Democrat won instead of five to two, it would be four to three. So Republicans would still have the majority on the Supreme Court. But Republicans fought tooth and nail to keep this voting going and to lower 
the turnout so that they would win. Uh, Republicans who control 63 of the 99 seats in the state assembly sent just one member. He brought the session to order and immediately ended it without taking up the governor's request. It took 17 seconds. In the Republican-controlled state Senate, the same thing happened. It took even less time. The legislature's defiance was a naked display of unabashed power, an elected body refusing its governor's request and turning its back on its constituents. In a time of crisis, I hope every goddamn one of them gets voted out. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you know that won't happen. You you know that there will be people voting Republican for Jesus or whatever. Sure, because uh, abortions. Because you know what? Yeah, because abortions. Yeah. Jesus and abortions. You know. Mm-hmm. So it was it was a travesty, but people turned out and people lined up, and mm-hmm. we will not have the results again until April thirteenth. But that's okay. Count you know, those I was, votes. I was looking forward to one hot take on Twitter that I'm being deprived of. Um, I wanted to hear Diamond and Silk talk about the Wisconsin election, but I can't because <laughs> they got banned from Twitter. I think they're back. They had to delete a tweet, Drift Glass. Yeah, that because. Was- <laughs> they thought that it was okay for people to come out, come out and be in the public. You know what? Yeah. It makes you sick staying home. You know what will make you cure you from the virus going out and being with people. Mm-hmm. And apparently Twitter thought you just told people to, to deliberately endanger themselves. And you've got the Im- imprimatur of the you know per- president cornered rat. No, you're going to have to spend a little time in Twitter jail. Now I'm sure there'll be martyrs greater than Jesus. I'm sure they'll be on either side of him as he is crucified. I'm sure they will sing to heaven about all the injustice that the liberal Twitter verse dropped on them. But I don't really care. I I am delighted to see that people are starting to make these clowns pay a price. I am thrilled that you noticed that, uh, what is Judicial Watch? Got cream today? Club for Growth. The Club for Growth. That's right. Yeah. No, I'm very pleased to see Club for Growth tried to do a rat fucking poll on uh, Governor Cuomo versus Biden. Yeah. And make this about, you know, let, let's let's stir up more discontent and make Democrats in disarray. And they had help from the New York Post yes, in promoting this stupid fake poll. Mm-hmm. And immediately it was like Club for Growth. No, that's bullshit. Ever all across Twitter, everybody just rejected it immediately. That surprised me and pleased me just how quickly mm-hmm. that happened. And uh, I did say on Twitter, you know, next up, let's do. Uh, judicial watch yeah. <laughs> and you said and then other people said Federalist. Uh, the federalist yeah <laughs> drag them masters out into the light yeah um now you might ask yourself how come donald trump can't hold on to employees who are not relatives blue gal why do you think that is i i don't know drift glass why can't he hold on to employees who are not related to him or married uh, to his ma- kids i think maybe because he's really really bad at being an executive and he sucks at everything and he's yeah. a terrible person i just think so those appearances on the apprentice were heavily edited yes they were <laughs> yes they were um now there's a bit of news that goes that it's here's the bad news and here's the good news mm-hmm uh, the bad news is that another 6.6 million Americans filed first-time unemployment last week. This is the largest and fastest string of job losses since 1948. Uh, more than 17 million new claims have been filed in the last three weeks. Economists estimate the U.S. unemployment rate is now 13%, which is the worst level of joblessness in this country since the Great Depression. The good news is COBOL is back, baby. COBOL, the computer program. Yeah, COBOL, everybody the, wants COBOL programmers. Everybody was because, and I, I was a COBOL programmer for like 15 years. And I worked. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I was a, I was a COBOL assembler. I, I, I can sling in JCL. I know all this shit. Old systems. I worked for insurance companies for years. And I also worked in the employment sector, in, in, uh, in workforce development. So I have, and the reason COBOL is necessary is because, all of these state unemployment systems and many of these state unemployment systems are ancient because they work. You just you, you put the stuff in and out comes the, the sausage at the other end. It's very straightforward. You don't need to update the code very much. But now we're pushing millions more people than were ever intended through. You might be adding benefits. You might be upping things. You might be breaking formulas for calculating unemployment rates. Lots of stuff in this code that was written during the probably the Kennedy administration needs to be actually – updated in a way that doesn't destroy the entire system. And so people are beating the bushes just like they did in Y2K for anybody with COBOL experience. And I happen to have COBOL experience. In fact, I'm looking at my template, my little plastic template right now that I used to use to trace flowcharts for decision trees for, for programming. So if you are out there in the world, 
And you know of a COBOL job. Apparently, there's this thing called the internet, and you can work from home, and it's just coding. Uh, please let me know, because I'd be happy to step in and A, do something for the public good, make those systems run well enough to get people the things they need when they need them. And B, I'd like to be able to tell my grandkids that I was one of the people who was employed during the great pandemic. Right. Yet, and and get a job. Yeah, that would be nice. Grandpa so Drift, we, that's we got a job. That. So, you know, 50 You got a job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it. That, you know, we are one of the people who hasn't had a full-time, a, a real full-time with benefits job, except for a very short period. Yeah, for over since a decade. The last, since the last since recession. Since the Great Recession. Since yeah. the Great Recession. And, and I'm yeah. not, and I'm joking, I'm, I'm not making a lot of people's situation, but I am yeah. pointing out that this country really does run on some pretty ancient infrastructure. Yeah. And if you don't pay oh, attention yeah. to it and you don't have people around who know how to work on it and people who know how to maintain it, it tends to fall apart when you need it most. So this is a little bit more of an object lesson than it is my resume online. You know, I think if we are able to elect Joe Biden president and vote blue no matter who and yep. have a Democratic Senate and Congress, we might actually get a real infrastructure week. Who knows? That could happen. <laughs> it could It could definitely happen. Uh, I, I think the bills are there and the wish list is definitely there. Uh, we're going to do news roundup real quick because yeah. we're, we're running out of time here. And there's, there's just way too much news, so we'll keep it very short. Um, the Minnesota GOP chair <laughs> called Democrats... Uh, communist control for using the coronavirus to close the beaches. Uh, her name is Jennifer Carnahan, and the Minneapolis uh, Park Board was closing the city beaches for the summer to limit the spread of COVID-19. Very responsible thing to do. Uh, her question was, was it necessary for Minneapolis to close the beaches for the summer in early April? Much can unfold, change, and transpire between now and then, she tweeted Friday. The Democrats have turned coronavirus into an excuse for extreme communist control. Wake up, people. Communist yeah. control. Yeah. Communists. Yeah. And that. All right. Look forward to a lot of that coming. Yeah. In the fall. Communism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. In the middle of this pandemic, Trump has decided that Obamacare markets will not reopen. Yeah. Yeah. They are reopening for people that are unemployed. That's just built into it. He's lying. Yeah. All right. Um, this is an actual exchange somewhat foreshortened between... All right. Why don't you be Trump and I'll be the reporter? Because you do a pretty good Trump. Trump. You always make me be Trump. Trump. I think mail-in voting is horrible. It's corrupt. You voted by mail in Florida's election last month, didn't you? Oh, sure. I can vote by mail. How do you reconcile with that? Because I'm allowed to. And that's all we have to say about that. The Trump administration is rolling back mileage standards for automobiles. Given the catastrophe they're in with the coronavirus, they're pursuing a policy that's going to hurt public health and kill people, yeah. one expert said. Yes. There's no, speaking of communism, yeah. There, there's no reason to roll back mileage standards for cars. At all. There's none. There's none. none other than you want to suck up to the people who paid your paid for your campaign who want to pollute more i mean i it's just it really is this reflexive uh carrying out of the republican agenda roll back all restrictions well it's making libs yeah. mad he's doing it to make libs oh, yeah. mad that's his idea undo of politics. obama yeah. once you undo obama then everything's right. fine right and mitch mcconnell's perfectly okay Let's, with that let me let me read from ellie mistal writing in the Please. nation within the last few weeks the governors of texas ohio iowa and alabama republicans all have taken advantage of the coronavirus pandemic to issue orders further restricting the rights of women their excuse is that abortions are elective medical procedures and therefore have to be put on hold alongside all the other elective procedures that are being suspended during a crisis, as if a woman's right to her body is akin to getting a nose job. Yeah. I have an elective procedure I'd like to do on some Republican men. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thriving yeah. future of more Republican children. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, Politico reported last week that a Trump administration official asked the Thai government for protective gear, only to be informed by the puzzled voices at the other end of the line that a U.S. shipment of the same supplies, the second of two so far, was already on its way to Bangkok. No one is fucking in charge. That's terrifying. The Trump administration is suspending affirmative action regulations based on the COVID crisis. And as we alluded to earlier, it isn't just um, old systems. It's 
when you have a Republican governor who goes out of his way to wreck public systems, mm -hmm. things get bad. Like Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, who was, who was warned about Florida's broken unemployment website last year. State auditors found the site had more than 600 system errors waiting to be fixed, but state officials had no process to evaluate and fix them. You know, no testing. So thanks, They could have Ron maybe DeSantis. hired a COBOL pr programmer to fix that. I, well, I think that I don't know for sure, but I think this was the new system. Oh. And the new system was designed, or at least it's a shell over an old system. I don't know. Don't quote me. I didn't do the analysis. I didn't write the code. But it sounds like it's, let's build a system that makes it really, really hard for people to get unemployment. We well, that's what giving... Rick Scott did. Yeah. yeah. Rick Scott yeah. did that. And, mm -hmm. and he did that so that he could pretend that unemployment claims were unemployment and say, yeah. look, we've got 2.2% unemployment in Florida. And all that meant was he'd put up a barricade to more any more than 2% of Floridians being able to apply for unemployment. Yeah. And uh, now you have another Republican governor, Ron DeSantis. I mean, this is, this is going on. This is what happens when you elect Republican governors. And frankly, when Democratic votes are suppressed, you get mm -hmm. Republican governors. Uh, it is time to clean up Florida's elections. Yeah. And the only way that happens is if you can get a Democrat in office. And it's mm -hmm. it's a push-me-pull-you situation. The feds are going to have to do something about it. And they're going to have to do something about it by pushing for civil rights yeah. for black voters and non-white voters in Florida to have access to the ballot. That that might mean vote by mail, like Donald Trump does. Where does he do that? Oh, in Florida. In Florida, Yeah. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. As usual on this podcast for Easter weekend, this week's internet kitties are rabbits. Bun Bun Stew and Ricky are back, folks. Yeah, we love Bun Bun Stew. Hello, Bun Ricky. Bun Bun Stew and Ricky. Mm -hmm. Remember that rabbits are exotic pets and should not be purchased for children at Easter time. We always remind people of that, that rabbits are, are persnickety and you want to take care of them the right way like bun bun stew and ricky who've been around for many years you know our friend mike k takes very good care of bun bun stew and ricky but little children shouldn't be given rabbits uh at easter no. time chocolate rabbits yeah but chocolate no, rabbits no. yes all the mm -hmm. chocolate rabbits but uh no real rabbits thank you and of course bun bun stew and ricky eat freshly poured pet food our fake sponsor whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck your rabbit cat or other pet will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. Happy spring to Bun Bun Stew and Ricky. You can see both of them at our Facebook page or website, and you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. I do owe people some thank you notes, and I'll be getting those out. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go, Postal Unions, letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Uh, we want to thank Bart for sending us a box of Hawaiian goodies. Yes. Uh, he's such a good guy. Yeah. And uh, we're still drinking that coffee. That Hawaiian coffee is dang good. I got to say. good. Got to say. Yeah. Got to yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we want to, th to do a shout out. Last week, we read a letter from a nurse who was in a big city hospital who was awaiting results of testing for coronavirus mm -hmm. and... Uh, that nurse got back to us and said they tested ne negative. So yeah. he's going back to work on Monday. And uh, again, we uh, are patting you on the back and are very proud of you and grateful for your service. Thank you. Very much so. Uh, and, and by the way, go Postal Unions, hashtag save the post office. Yeah. yeah. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love, and we love you, and we know times are tough for folks, but if you can afford to support this podcast with a contribution, please know that we deeply appreciate it. And you should probably know that what happens with your contribution is it's a pass through to our grocery stores. and We, we buy food for the kids, and yep. we buy, pay our electric bill. Anyway, you support us and, and our uh, fabulously lower middle class lifestyle, and we appreciate it very, <laughs> very good. much. And by the way, we are very <laughs> grateful to have all the kids under one roof, yep. all safe and all healthy as far as we know, and just mm -hmm. 
we we are enormously blessed and thankful for your support and your friendship. Yes, we are. Please share our show on social media. And thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties still cannot believe that Mike Gravel dropped out. Who? Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020. DGBG Productions.